Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar about product marking compliance brought to you by the Institute of Exports and International Trade. This is the latest in a series of webinars we are running about trading in uncertain times, which we began at the end of last year. My name is William barnes -Gray. I'm the Senior Content Editor at the Institute, and I will be your host for the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, next slide, play, please. We're going to begin today's webinar with a poll to understand a little bit more about you, our audience. So I've just launched a poll here. We are asking, uh, well, hopefully you will know by now that the new rules for EU to GB imports came in on New Year's Day. And we are here looking to gauge to what extent you have been impacted by this so far, albeit quite early on in 2022. So your options range from significantly impacted to not impacted yet and do not expect to be, and there's a not sure too early to tell option two. While you are answering that poll, just a quick couple of housekeeping notes. Firstly, you can contact me with any comments or questions using the question panel on the control window to the right hand side of your screen. We hope to get to a number of your questions towards the end of the webinar, though please bear in mind we have already received a fair few questions in advance, so I cannot guarantee we'll get to all of your queries today. If you feel as though your question has not been answered, please do review our technical helpline or training and consultancy offerings, which we will be talking about during the webinar. A quick tip on questions. If your questions are easy for me to understand, I am far more likely to ask them. So please do try to keep them quite clear and concise. Secondly, you will receive access to today's slide pack and a recording of the webinar in a follow-up email we will be sending over the next day or so. So please do try to listen in as carefully as you can to today's presentation, as you can read them back, uh, read the slides back at a later time. But I'm going to now quickly share the results of that poll. And thank you everyone for answering as ever. It's always great to, to hear how you're responding to, to new rules post Brexit and a real range of uh, answers actually. So 15% of you have said you're significantly impacted, 28% minimally impacted, 25% uh, not impacted but expect to be, 13% do not expect to be impacted and 20% not sure, too early to tell. So I think the headline there is 15% significantly impacted. Right, if we move on to the next slide though. Next slide, yep, thank you. It is my delight to be joined today by Suzanne Adekwin, a customs consultant at the Institute. Uh, and this is indeed Suzanne's debut presenting at one of our webinars. So welcome, Suzanne and we'll, join, we'll be joined later on by uh, one of our reg regulars, Paul Woodward, for the Q&A. Paul is a customs and trade specialist at the Institute. Now, Suzanne, welcome aboard. Uh, really looking forward to your presentation today. Uh, we're a few weeks into the new rules for imports from the EU, but does the response to that poll, 15% saying they've been significantly impacted, does that surprise you in any way? I don't think so, Will. Um, you know, 15%, there's quite a lot of companies in the country that really only traded with Europe. So we've had that grace period of the year to get used to the requirements. So again, although it's a slight transition to help traders, having to now actually work through those import formalities, it is still sort of like a, a hard point now for traders to, uh, to get used to. So that's what we're here for. We're here to help traders overcome any of those obstacles um, so that they can start to become confident in the new requirements. So um, certainly exciting times ahead this year um, and we hope to uh, be able to help our members with any requirements that they have. Thanks Suzanne and as, as said we are here to help and we have done several webinars on these new rules so we will we can share those links afterwards. If we move on to the next slide, we have a fair bit to address today. So it is my delight to hand over to Suzanne to, uh, to yeah, talk about, first of all, what series this webinar is part of, and then the new rules for product marketing compliance. Over to you, Suzanne. Thanks very much, Will. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. The webinar today is part of our series covering trading in uncertain times. At the Institute of Export and International Trade, we're increasing our level of real-time support on offer to our members and to help with export and import planning. Our services include real-time news alerts and enhanced telephone helpline for business members only. 
we have a new live web chat function giving expert answers to your questions which has been a really popular addition to our service offering today and if you really are struggling to come to terms with any of those new requirements for imports then we'd be certainly glad to help you we're also expanding on our range of webinars like the one that you're attending today we are also offering a new one-day training course with dynamic content which takes into account developments as they're happening to help members as keep you all up to date as possible with the latest in the international trade arena we're also pleased to confirm our new consultancy package offering which is focused on managing trade change and risk if you're not a member already you can have a chat with our membership team and they'll be happy to discuss how you can start to take advantage of the great services we have available okay so let's move on to our topic of the day which is product marking compliance if i could have the next slide please so today we're going to look at the uk ca requirements and understand what's needed to sell those goods into great britain and northern ireland we'll have a look at what are product markings why we need them and we'll also look at the implications of the trade and cooperation agreement between the uk and the eu where product safety is covered and what are the CE requirements for Great Britain companies selling into the EU. We'll also have a reminder of the technical files that need to be produced, including those declarations of conformity, and who are the new representative parties that are now needed for trading in the UK and in the EU, following these changes to the regulations and legislations after the UK left the EU. And finally, we'll have a quick overview of the next steps that you need to consider to continue with compliance on product safety and the business challenges that you may face in a dynamic trading market. So firstly, we're going to take a look at what are product markings. Next slide, please. Product markings allow us to identify the product. So all products bear different product markings. For example, the batch number, the serial numbers, we start to see those QR codes nowadays, that date of expiry and the manufacturer's name and address. Products that are on sale to consumers will have to have undergone testing for product safety, and this is based on the regulations and standards that govern their industry. Product markings also show if there are any hazards or warnings associated with the products, such as the caution or flammable pictograms on aerosols, or the lightning bolt on products where there is an electrical shock hazard. Products can also bear markings to show the regulation and standard that the product complies with, and who is the conformity assessor so was it that testing house or is it actually the trader themselves if they've done that self-declaration the ukca and ce marks are used to show products conform with product safety regulations and as well as displaying instructions for product use they may also show marks for the disposal of products for example crossed out wheelie bin to show the product cannot be put in the general waste or that recycling mark to show that a product can be recycled. Next slide, please. So the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, the TCA, that the UK has with the EU, this contains several provisions aimed at preventing and addressing unnecessary barriers to trade. And for product safety, these requirements can be found in Chapter 4 on the Technical Barriers to Trade. It applies to the preparation, adoption, and application of all standards and technical regulations and conformity assessment procedures, which may affect trading goods between the EU and the UK. Article 91 specifically details that both parties shall use international standards as a basis for its technical regulations. This reduces the burden on manufacturers to produce their goods to different standards. Although the products will need to be tested by separate UK and EU testing houses to be compliant to both of those sets of regulations. The key provisions for product safety under the TCA are for medicinal products in Annex 12. This is where the TCA provides mutual recognition of good manufacturing practice inspections and certificates, and both sides will recognise inspections carried out by each other and will use international standards, practices and guidelines developed by the World Health Organization to ensure a high level of protection of public health. Secondly, we have motor vehicles in Annex 11. So the TCA here confirms the UK and the EU will mutually recognize approvals based on UN regulations and global technical regulations. Both parties will 
cooperate on market surveillance to support the identification of non-conforming vehicles, components and systems. So as we can see, there is a certain level of mutual understanding and sharing of information under these two annexes. Next slide, please. So the UK Conformity Assessed, or the UK CA mark for short, is the new product safety mark that's used for goods being placed on the market in Great Britain to show that products conform with the relevant standards and legislation of a particular sector in this country. It also applies to overseas manufacturers, so those companies based in the EU or the rest of the world, like China, who are shipping goods into Great Britain. And these manufacturers will be required to appoint an authorised representative in Great Britain to represent their products on the Great Britain marketplace. So all those imports coming in will have to comply with the UKCA regulations. UKCA marking applies to goods previously subject to CE marking, such as radio equipment, low voltage electrical equipment, aerosols, toys and PPE. And there are some product categories that have extra requirements to the regulations, which is typically a different implementation date or a different requirement for a responsible person. And these are split down into medical devices, rail interoperability, construction products and civil explosives. And further information on these can be found on the gov.uk website. Manufacturers will need to build a technical file that evidences the standards and the legislation that govern the products. And the Declaration of Conformity is issued to demonstrate that compliance. Manufacturers can also continue to make a self-declaration of conformity for UKCA as they would have done under the CE requirements. In Northern Ireland, there is a requirement to use either the CE mark or the UK NI mark. And we'll look at this in more detail on the next slide. The deadline for full compliance with UKCA was pushed out to the 1st of January 2024. And this is where products will need to bear the UKCA mark in its own right. The extended timeline is giving manufacturers time to adapt to the new requirements of the full introduction of the UKCA mark. Next slide, please. So with the Northern Ireland Protocol in place to prevent there being a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, there are special rules that now apply to placing goods on the marketplace in Northern Ireland itself. So within the agreement, the UK have agreed that Northern Ireland will remain in the EU Customs Union, which pushes the customs border to the ports and airports of Northern Ireland, creating a customs border in effect with mainland Great Britain. However, with both the UK and the EU discussing how the protocol can be improved, any changes made could have a profound effect on the requirements for manufacturers in Northern Ireland and those in Great Britain as well, shipping their goods into Northern Ireland. The UK MI marking was introduced as the new conformity marking for products placed on the market in Northern Ireland. And these are products which have undergone mandatory third party conformity assessment by a body based in Northern Ireland. The UK NI marking is to only be used within Northern Ireland itself. So those manufacturers making their products and selling them all within that one region. As a manufacturer based in Northern Ireland, products will need to comply with both the UK and the EU regulations. And this is why the products will therefore have to bear the UK NI mark to comply with the UK regulation and the CE mark as well to show compliance to the EU regulation. The UK NI mark is not allowed to be used on its own. Therefore, those traders in Northern Ireland will need to make sure they have the UK NI and the CE mark on their products. With the alignment of regulations and standards, this will mean manufacturers can design products to the same standards, but will need to carry out conformity assessments based on both regulations. A UK and an EU or NI notified body will need to be employed to carry out any testing, where self-declaration cannot be carried out under the regulations. So again, just check those regulations to see what those requirements are and whether you do actually need that testing house. The products will require a technical file and declarations of conformity for each of the regulations. So one for the CE and one for the UK and I. 
and those two sets of files are going to show that compliance to any authority that requires them. An overseas manufacturer will be required to appoint an authorised representative and responsible person in Great Britain and in Northern Ireland or in the EU if they want to place their products on Great Britain and Northern Ireland marketplaces. So in this case, they can't just look at just the UK CA, they're going to have to also look at the CE. So quite a lot of extra work for overseas representatives to be looking at when they're looking to put those products into the UK market. Any products manufactured outside of Northern Ireland that are sold into Northern Ireland will only need to bear that CE mark. So again, this is somewhere something that the overseas manufacturers need to consider where are they actually going to be selling their products. If we could have the next slide, please. So on this slide, we're going to look at the UK CA timeline. So on the time, we have the 1st of January 2021, which was last year. And this is when the UK government introduced the UK CA and UK MI marks. Any new products that are placed on the Great Britain marketplace bear the UK CA mark. And in Northern Ireland, if manufactured and sold into Northern Ireland, as we've just mentioned, they bear the UK NI mark. If products are manufactured in Great Britain and sold to Northern Ireland, these products will continue to bear the CE mark plus the UK CA mark to show both regulatory compliance to the UK and the EU requirements. And to note as well that for the time being, any CE marked stock that was placed on the UK market before the 1st of January 2021 can continue to be supplied in Great Britain until the 31st of December 2022. So we now fast forward to next year, we move on to the 1st of January 2023. And this is where the UK government have extended the deadline for compliance with the UK CA marking. CE mark stock will no longer be able to be placed on the Great Britain market from this date. All products sold will need to bear the UK CA mark and an over label is currently sufficient until the 31st of December 2023. So the latest information that we have is that from the 1st of January 2024, so in roughly two years time, the products will need to bear the UK CA mark in its own right. The introduction of the UK CA mark with the extended timeline is giving manufacturers that time to adapt to those new, reg new requirements. Could I have the next slide please? So as we've just said, any CE mark products that were placed on the UK market before the 1st of January 2021 will continue to be compliant until they are sold to their final end user. If a company had been supplying customers in the EU before January 2021, for the existing CE mark to continue to be valid on any newly manufactured products, accreditations issued by GB notified bodies had to be transferred to the EU or Northern Ireland established notified bodies and technical files and declarations of conformity updated accordingly. As Great Britain is outside the EU, there is a change to the responsibilities of the manufacturer, distributor and EU importer in bringing goods into the EU. The main areas of change are the appointment of an EU established notified body, mandating an authorised representative and responsible person and updated documentation and declarations of conformity to accompany the goods. Although CE marking is a safety regulation, some items may attract attention at customs, for example toys and electrical goods, and customs may carry out an extra physical check of the products, documentation and certification at the border point before allowing the goods to be imported. So it's quite prudent to be making sure that all that information is available and passed over to the forwarder when the shipments are being uh, collected so that it can pass through that border without an issue. If we could have the next slide, please. So under the UKCA, it's highly likely that if you are issuing self-declarations under the CE regulations, you will be able to continue to do so under the UK regulations. But please check the relevant product legislation for your products in your sector, just to see what those exact individual requirements are. 
Under UK law, a declaration of conformity is a contract between the manufacturer and the customer stating compliance to all relevant UK requirements. The document is largely based on the EU CE Declaration of Conformity, where the manufacturer authorised representative declare that the product is in conformity with the relevant statutory requirements applicable to the specific product. Key points that must be included on the declaration are uh, the identification of the product, so batch or serial number, for that traceability and batch recall purposes, a description of the product, and statement that the product conforms with the relevant legislation. We also need the name and address of the manufacturer or their authorised representative, so the authorities know who that person is responsible for that product on the marketplace. The relevant regulations which apply to the product and which standards are applicable that have been used to carry out the conformity assessment also need to be documented there. And if a third party company have carried out the conformity assessment, they also need to be detailed on the declaration. And finally, the signature of the manufacturer or authorised representative needs to be included, and this all makes that documentation official. Next slide, please. So manufacturers outside of the UK, as we mentioned earlier, are they going to need to appoint a UK-based authorised representative to represent their products in the UK? They must receive a written mandate from the manufacturer appointing them as their representative and comply with all the duties imposed by the manufacturer that they are expected to perform on their behalf. They can be based in Great Britain or Northern Ireland as well. The authorised representative must keep a technical file of the technical documents that demonstrates the products conform with the UK regulatory requirements. They are legally required to be held on file for 10 years after the product is placed on the Great Britain marketplace. The declaration of conformity that is drawn up must have the name and address of the authorised representative and should be available to market surveillance authorities upon request. Manufacturers outside of the EU are now required to appoint a responsible person based in the EU to represent their products. They must also receive a written mandate from the manufacturer appointing them as their representative and comply with all duties laid down in that mandate. The responsible person's contact information must be labelled on the product or packaging for traceability purposes and they are legally responsible for the CE marking of the product, retaining the technical documentation and declaration of conformity and to cooperate with the authorities in the event of an enforcement action being taken for faulty product, such as product recalls. Next slide, please. So the new challenges that are facing companies um, is to have to make sure that they have recognised representatives in the UK and the EU if your company is not set up in these areas. So again, checking the legislation to see if you need a responsible person or an authorised representative, as the requirements will vary from industry to industry. You need to check the new UK regulations for your industry and make sure that existing products can continue to comply with requirements under the UK CA regulations. And understanding what's your product liability. What happens if a defective product ends up on the marketplace? Who in the supply chain will be responsible for this if it's in the EU? So making sure that there are contracts in place with those parties who are representing your company and products in the EU, which is that written mandate we mentioned, so that there, if there are any issues, then they will be swiftly handled by that representative and the authorities. And this is in itself poses an issue for traders who are now not in control of that local arrangement in the EU and having to rely on third parties to take up that responsibility on their behalf. So it's really critical that companies select a reliable partner to represent their company and their products, a company that is going to actually be an extension of their brand and their company values. These partners as well will be responsible for the document files, the records and any regulatory compliance reporting to the authorities, so traders must have confidence in the responsible parties that they choose to work with. Next slide, please. So the next steps that you need to take is to understand the UK legislation and standards for your products, check if they would be compliant, 
and look into printing any over labels of the UK CA mark for now whilst the design of the product is being amended to include the new UK CA mark. Remember if you're selling into Northern Ireland or the EU, you can display the CE mark alongside the UK CA mark as long as you are compliant with both sets of regulations. The technical documents need to be updated to refer to the UK legislation standards and authorities and where required, submitted for that conformity assessment. The declaration of conformity can then be issued and all new documentation can be shared with other members of the supply chain. The importers where goods are coming into Great Britain market from outside, distributors supplying your products and if you are appointing an authorised representative, if you're based outside of Great Britain, the documentation can be passed on to them too. And just a reminder that the deadline to be fully UKCA compliant is currently the 1st of January 2024. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suzanne. And if we move on to the next slide, I believe it's my turn to interject into a quick poll and we're going to have questions uh, during this poll as well. So uh, we're just going to ask you, uh, how important is it to your business and your clients that the UK obtain more mutual recognition agreements on conformity assessments? Um, we've been asked to ask this poll um, uh, because we're, we're doing some work with to feedback to government on these issues. and. If you, um, it'd be great to hear about your experiences with country examples and conformity assessments and the time and costs to the business from not having mutual recognition agreements in place. So if you can either message in any kind of further comments on this issue uh, through the uh, question panel or ideally through the exit survey at the end of the webinar, that would be really helpful. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so we're heading to the questions now and we're delighted to be joined as well by Paul Woodward for this part of the webinar. Hi Paul, how are you? I will, I'm fine. Good afternoon everybody. It's a pleasure to be supporting Suzanne today on this webinar. Great to have you. Um, if I can start with a question for yourself Paul, and this is one which kind of places uh, this topic within the context of the other Trading in Uncertain Times webinars we've been doing. The Northern Ireland Protocol continues to be a negotiating point between the UK and the EU. What would happen in Northern Ireland regarding product marking requirements should the Northern Ireland Protocol be revoked or amended? Well, that's a great question, actually, Will. Um, yeah, the Northern Ireland Protocol, remember, is there um, and intended to protect, um, obviously, the Northern Ireland market, um, obviously, the imposition of not having a hard border there also in relation to the Good Friday Agreement as well. Um, so any amendment that we would see um, would stipulate whether Northern Ireland remains in the single market or not. Remember, there isn't a hard border there currently. We know um, the rhetoric in previous months between the UK and the EU has not been the most positive, but with the latest updates that we've got from Liz Trust, then it's looking like there is going to be um, an agreement and an update in regard to that in the not too distant future. But also the elements there of the fact of the, the, the constraints that won't put on business, because if um, obviously there was an element of the Northern Ireland Protocol being revoked, then potentially that could be a hard border. Therefore, we're looking at obviously the UK in its entirety, including Northern Ireland, just coming under the UK conformity assessments. But still, if you wanted to sell products, even in that state to the EU, you still would need CE marking. So I suppose that it would um, eradicate the need for CE markings in Northern Ireland if, if the products were just going to stay within the UK internal market. Um, this doesn't seem to be the case. A lot of um, the threats of issuing Article 16 about what these webinars are all about and trading in uncertain times um, has gone away along with um, the EU threatening more non-tariff um, barriers to trade as well. So now with the more positive dialogue, it looks like the deal will be coming um, sooner rather than later. Um, but in regard to the product compliance, um, I suppose it's based on what is that outcome, but we do know if there is a hard border and um, Northern Ireland isn't part of the single market, then UK conformity assessments would only apply. 
But again, just if you were going to export goods to the EU, CE markings would be required. Just staying on the point of trading on uncertain times more broadly, when the protocol negotiations looked a bit more uncertain at the end of mm. uh, last year, there was talk of you know something drastic could happen, like the trade deal being revoked or something like that. I mean, sure. what would happen? I mean, Suzanne's touched on the, the the stipulations within the trade deal for product marking compliance requirements. Well, what would happen if that trade deal were to be revoked in a, in a hypothetical situation? Yeah, sure. It was a concern, um, you know, very apt with all businesses within the UK and also the EU as well. Um, you know, there are special provisions which are in place within um, the trade and cooperation agreement. Um, Suzanne's mentioned a few of those today. Uh, medicines, motor vehicles, there's also organic products and wine. Um, so I suppose if we look at each of those in question, you'd have to be looking at the fact that there's a memorandum of understanding that would that would not be the case if we didn't have a free trade agreement. That meant each country or each customs union would dictate their own requirements for regulations that would be needed. And they could put more um, restrictive um, non-barriers to trade in place because from that aspect, they could be trying to stop foreign products coming into their country. Some of these non-barriers would be, you know, extra requirements, extra representation, extra hoops to jump through. Um, if we look at the motor vehicles as one of the special provisions as well, um, it means that no party then could uh, currently could introduce or maintain any domestic technical regulations, markings, conformity assessments. But obviously, if the free trade agreement's not there, that provision would go away. Domestic countries would be able to do that to prohibit, restrict or increase the burden on businesses for importing a good or even a service um, into those domestic markets. At the moment, with motor vehicles, they're aligned to the UN regulations and that's the product type to approval assessment. Um, so with this being removed, we could see a lot more greater non-tariff barriers to trade being introduced. If we looked at medicines, for instance, another one of the special provisions there, um, Suzanne mentioned good manufacturing practice. So this is there concerning any relevant laws, regulation and technical guidance. So this really covers um, both parties currently um, for both medicinal products for human use and veterinarian use. Any removal of this could create, again, additional measures that would need to be adhered to. So we're going to see more relevance. And I know we've spoken about this on various um, webinars in this Article 16 series. The non-barriers to tariff barriers to trade was an important subject. These can be a lot more enforced and a lot more restrictive than increasing a tariff and create bigger constraints for businesses that are trying to operate there. If we look at, um, we've got the last two on the special revisions here. So let's let's come to wine now. This allows pre-existing um, labelling to continue. So that removes barriers to trade, yeah, between UK and EU. So if the UK is bringing in champagne from the Champagne region in France, you know, if we're looking at um, sparkling wine from certain locations within the UK, there is agreed labelling, no extra constraints that need to be put in. So at the moment, um, importing wine into the UK um, has existing duty suspension process um, and currently that wouldn't change but if it did that would then become a bone of contention would a duty suspension be removed from any product from the EU also we're currently using the UK VI1 certificate um, which is not actually required for any imports of wine from the EU into Great Britain that could play then a significant part and could be seen as a non-tariff barrier to trade as well. So if any removal or amendment to this provision would create extra administrative burdens, more costs, and therefore that would increase um, the cost of goods to services and onto the end consumer as well. And finally, if we look at the organics one, the last special provision which is there, currently we have cooperation with our organic standards within the UK EU. This means if you attest to them, then you don't need, they are mutually recognised. You don't have to have additional labels or testing going into those markets. So if 
the trade deal was to be removed, that would cease to exist. There wouldn't be any mutual recognition. You would need to attest to organic standards in the EU and separately in the UK, which could create great burdens for this growing industry. So again, um, implications also on there, extra certification, delays in trade, additional costs, and potential changes to processes of what requirements you need to meet. Thank you, Will. Thanks, Paul. Very, very thorough answer there. So I hope that's helped everyone. I'm just going to share the results of the poll because I think it's, it's as ever quite interesting. So uh, mutual recognition agreements on conformity assessments, 47% of you think this is essential for you or your business, 32% quite important and only 7% not not very important and I've heard 40% not sure. So that's quite convincing I'd say that people on this call generally think that they are important. So thank you everyone for responding to that poll, really useful to know. So thank you very much. Uh, Suzanne, if I can bring you back in, uh, just to, obviously there's more to the world than the UK, the EU and Northern Ireland, there's markets in China, the US, uh, Japan with whom we've got a trade deal of course. Um, what are the product marking requirements in other major markets which people on the line should, should be aware, aware of or aware of? Um, yes, yeah, so thanks Will. Um, so yes, product marking requirements are required in quite a lot of um, different markets and this is where we do start to see um, alignment throughout those trade deals that people put in place that mutual recognition agreement that you just mentioned in the poll 47% um, of traders saying that it is essential then it, it is really important that those traders don't come across any barriers to um, them being able to sell their products in, in other markets so every free trade agreement um, that we negotiate with other, those other countries, it has sections regarding product compliance standards, technical requirements one way or another. Um, each of these free trade agreements um, is specific to each country and each requirement and they often promote, um, like with the economic partnerships, we see that they promote um, selling our products into uh, some of those uh, uh, I can't think what they're called, um, uh, the developing countries, um, we also agree to take their products as well and that's one way that we can actually start to in, uh, help improve the um, uh, marking requirements and the product safety standards of those products coming into the UK. <clears throat> so although the free trade agreements can remove those barriers to trade and help with the duty reduction programmes, um, we also see the rules of origin, um, we often find that it can be quite a complex challenge for businesses. Um, and if companies are working across those different geographies or trading blocks, you know, they may do a bit of cross trade with manufacturing in, in the Asian region, for example, um, these challenges can actually become quite burdensome. So given this, it's um, perhaps uh, unsurprising that only 30% of companies actually leverage all of the FTAs that they could. So good to see that, uh, you know, a good half of our audience today um, are really interested in understanding more information about that. Um, you know, the government are working quite hard to put agreements in place and we're starting to see um, little bits of news coming out with the development of those trade agreements with countries like the USA and also India. Um, but that's 60%, well, 70%, if we could do the maths right, uh, of companies that are actually missing out on these opportunities. So, you know, the companies have cited three major reasons for this. So they're finding that the rules of the free trade agreement are actually quite complex to understand you know in particular those rules of origin on accumulation calculating the percentages of value of components and building it up and does that actually work out to allow you to declare goods of that origin so that that does sort of add complications for traders also difficulty in obtaining that supporting documentation from suppliers to prove that origin we also find that people have um, a lack of in-house expertise because they're not used to dealing with overseas markets. Um, understanding the requirements and the legal uh, regulations that are put in place and quite often these things can be driven by those customers overseas who want to actually benefit by importing those products into their country from the UK and benefit from that trade agreement. So for inst instance with the new UK and the Japanese free trade agreement there are specific provisions for motor vehicles and wine sectors so again a bit like the TCA um, and it's the comprehensive economic partnership agreement um, and it in itself it replicates the effect of the EU Japan mutual recognition agreement for the conformity assessment through a new protocol on mutual recognition 
the mutual recognition protocol provides measures to simply simplify the process of demonstrating compliance with safety and other regulatory standards. So for example, the MRA protocol's good manufacturing practice for medicinal products. This requires the UK and Japan to recognize each other's inspection and audit systems. So this is very similar to what we saw um, in the TCA, um, as, uh, as we explained earlier on. So, so yes, it's, uh, it's really important that we do continue to see those agreements being made and that it is really benefiting companies in this country to um, help them um, export to the wider world. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Suzanne. Again, a really thorough answer. So I hope that's been helpful, everyone. Uh, back to you, guys, CEO Mark. Uh, question for Paul. Uh, this is from Deborah. So Deborah's asked how many testing stations there will be. Will there be in the UK for the new mark if it actually goes ahead? Uh, I'm not assuming it's going ahead, but uh, Paul, how many, how many <laughs> testing stations? I think um, it's a great question. I think we can't get out of the fact that it is coming. To be honest with you, we've seen Suzanne give you the clear deadlines there. It is something which will come as part of um, the post um, transition world that we are now all experiencing, especially with the new customs changes. It's a really good question, though. Um, so we know the UK, you know, the UKCA is going to happen. Um, we have seen delays from UK government and easements that have come into place. So um, the fact that you can self declare some provisions there. Um, if you've not got special requirements on your products, you can self-declare. Um, that can be stated on your commercial invoices. You don't have to physically have them on the goods until the 1st of January 2024. So again, easements there to help businesses get ready for these changes, um, which is really important. And remember that if you do self-declare, um, if your products do not fall under any specific products and have additional controls, remember you don't need a third party to do this. You can undertake that self-accreditation for the UKCA mark yourself. So again, not that over-reliance on third parties there as well, remembering um, what your products, what controls they're enforced by. If they haven't got any additional controls, which are stated on the government pages, then self-declaring is an option for you. And although we know we've got the UK CA logo, we've got all the artwork, we've got all the dimensions they need to be, where they need to be affixed on them. Um, that is actually free. Um, but industry from a recent report at the end of last year um, has estimated it will cost around £600 per product to introduce this into their packaging um, and, and on the physically on the product themselves. Um, again, that's going to be dependent on the amount of product lines you have and offering. So again, that's per product that you'd be looking at. But again, this could, you know, by the amount you've got, that could extend to quite a significant cost. Um, and remember that the, the logo doesn't need to be added to the physical product until the 1st of Jan 2024. Um, in regard to the testing houses, well, we do have the UK market conformity um, assessment body called UKMCAB. Um, and this is a database and it serves as a UK database for conformity assessment bodies, also known as CABs to be short. Um, and it is a definitive source and a register of UK government appointed um, assessment bodies that can certify your goods both for GB and for the Northern Ireland market. So yes, good news is there's a general database out there, a register which is available on HMRC's pages, on the .gov pages, and it will list everybody that you can use. Currently, we've got 155 bodies on there that can perform these tasks for business. So again, there is a plethora of bodies out there Yes, you're going to see if you do Google searches, lots of ads there promoting it with specific companies. But um, the UKMCAB is where you'd be looking for for that database to understand who can do it, who's close to you, speak to a few people who can offer the best service for your business. OK. Thanks, Paul. Uh, again, really good answer. Um, because of uh, how long these, these answers have been, how far have they been, uh, we'll do one more uh, for Suzanne, if we may. Uh, it's from Owen, who has asked if we could talk about the requirement for product marking in regard to extended product responsibility that is now being implemented in Germany and France, obviously two major EU markets with the UK. So uh, Suzanne, can you say a little bit about extended product responsibility? 
Yeah, and it's not just Germany and France either. Um, we're seeing that throughout um, the whole of um, Europe. So I think in total is about 25 uh, countries that are actually uh, now implementing this, and the UK itself is also looking into it. Um, so the Extended uh, Producer Responsibility, the EPR, is an environmental policy that regulates a producer's responsibility for a product throughout its whole product's life cycle. A producer takes that responsibility for the financing, the collection, the recycling and the end of life disposal of the waste, electrical and electronic equipment directive, the, the WE, um, the batteries, accumulators and packaging and other EPR product categories. So under the EPR regulations, a producer of products that's subject to the regulations must mitigate the environmental impacts of their products throughout the whole product life cycle. So the different obligations for the producer, um, they're mainly regulated by the following EU directives. So as we mentioned, the WE directive, the battery directive and the packaging directive. So if you're a producer of products that are subject to the regulations, you are obliged to have your EPR registration numbers available. If you're a producer and you don't have your registration numbers, then you're required to register to obtain them. And again, if you're not a producer, but you're a seller, then you're still subject to the regulations and you need to obtain the EPR numbers from the upstream supplier. However, if this is not possible, then you are required to register to obtain them before sales and to note that you actually can't place your products on the marketplace and sell them until you have obtained the EPR numbers, the authorizations. So as I said, in the EU, we've got about 25 countries that are actually uh, put the measures in place for packaging waste and most countries feature a mix of both collective and individual producer responsibility. The UK has opened up a consultation regarding EPR and we're expecting the government to publish its full report uh, sometime later this year. Under the extended producer responsibility, anyone selling packaged products in the UK will be obligated to comply with mandatory labelling requirements regardless of the size of their company. So this is going to affect all primary point of sale packaging and all the components that are incorporated within it but also all shipping packaging that's associated with online catalogue or over the phone purchases that are delivered directly or collected at store. The labelling for products is also going to need to state either recycle or do not recycle and this is something that's been in the news actually this week that DEFRA is actually pushing for this due to the amount of recycled waste that is incorrectly sorted that cannot be accepted for recycling and currently costing councils hundreds of thousands of pounds for that extra disposal requirements. I think as householders are thinking that all plastic could be recycled as it's they have a wheelie bin for the plastic. But also biogradable, bio-based and compostable packaging would be clusters do not recycle. So at the moment a lot of people think again these would all come under recycle because they, they do that biodegrading and they're compostable, but that isn't going to be the case under the EPR regulations. So a quick timeline of what, we, um, what we've seen for this. In 2021, that was the government consultation, um, looking into its findings to be published um, mid-2022 this year. And then in this year, we're going to see the producers collecting their packaging data and the publishing of the UK EPR regulations in line with the organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. And then next year, 2023, the producers will report against new packaging formats rollout in England. And in 2024, the rest of the UK will become operational with material recycling targets to be met. And then from 2026 to 2027, the recycling labelling is going to become mandatory. Fantastic. Um, we have run out of time of questions now. Um, just uh, we had a request for the link to the um, uh, conformity, conformity assessment bodies from HMRC. We just posted that in the chat and we'll include that in the follow up message as well. So thank you, uh, Dale. I think we requested that we posted that there. I hope that's useful. But yeah, we've run out of time of questions. Uh, but thank you so much to Paul and Suzanne for the presentation and answers today. I hope everyone has found that useful. Thank you so much for so many terrific questions. We'll have to see how we can uh, 
maybe do an FAQ or something like that on the on the website after uh, at some point. So yeah, thank you so much for for attending and for the questions. But just a reminder on the last slide that today's webinar has been delivered as part of our trading in uncertain times suite of enhanced support, helping traders to continue trading despite Brexit rule changes, global supply chain issues, and various other ongoing geopolitical tensions. Uh, as Suzanne Suzanne sorry uh, mentioned earlier. This suite includes real-time news and enhanced telephone helpline for our business members, a new live web chat function, a new one-day, uh, a new consultancy, and more webinars just like this one in uh, in the coming months. We hope. But for more information, do look at the website. Uh, the URLs there that'll be in the slides we sent everyone afterwards. For now, though, thank you for tuning in, everyone. We hope you found that useful, and please do let us know what you thought of today's webinar in the exit survey. But for now, goodbye. Thanks, everyone.